This week in the Rochester Press Box from Salvador's Pizzeria at the historic Garage Door Restaurant. I'm Brother Weeze. I'll tell you why that movie Draft Day came to life in the real draft this year. And I'm John Natulio, and I'll tell you who I think is the worst first round pick the Bills have ever had. And I'm Mike Catalana. I'll tell you why the draft gurus are like your real estate agent. And I'm Bill Pucko with the referendum on EJ Manuel. Join us this weekend in the Rochester Press Box. The Rochester Press Box is brought to you by Salvatore's at the Garage Door, Rochester's choice winner for Best Pizzeria, featuring Wacky Wing Wednesday and the Super Slice. It's as big as your head. The games are always on at the Garage Door, home to the Rochester Press Box. everyone and welcome to the Rochester Press Box here from Salvador's Pizzeria at the historic Garage Door Restaurant in Irondequoit. I'm Bill Pucko, joined by WHDK Sports Director John DiTullio. Billy, good to be here, buddy. 13 Wham News Sports Director Mike Catalana. Good to be here. And it's a pleasure to have back from 95-1 The Brew, the great brother Weez. Thank you very much, Bill. <laughs> All right. Well, we had a lot, of, a lot of social issues that come up the last couple of weeks. Uh, Weez, I think I'll go to you first. What was your reaction when you either saw or heard that the seventh round draft pick of the St. Louis Rams, Michael Sam, kissed his significant other on the air during the draft? Well, I actually uh, just heard about it the next day because I'm not that deep into sports. Everyone else had seen it 42 times by the time I even heard about it. Uh, to be honest with you, I'm a humongous liberal, not that popular these days that take, and I'm all you know pro-gay marriage and everything, but still, I still, I used to talk to Brother Johnny, as liberal as I am and as gay-friendly as I am, I'm a, I got a bad blood thing. I don't need to see the kissing personally, but I'm not those people and get the feeling whatever they had as lovers and maybe family. What do I know? I know that I'm a little sissy about it. I don't, I don't need to see it. I haven't even seen it. Yeah, me either, actually, even, but you know, it certainly got a lot of print. Tons. John, you're on the other side. It didn't bother me. It, it, it didn't. We were having a conversation just kissing on TV. Does it make most people uncomfortable, any couples? No. We saw Al Gore and Tipper kissing. It seemed to make those two actually that's uncomfortable. A good, that's a good one. When they kiss. So maybe just people kissing in general makes all of us uncomfortable. But, you know, amen to Michael Sam. Wait, I got a good one. Yeah. Michael Jackson and Lisa Marie Presley. There you go. That was one people were going, what's going down yeah, over there? You didn't yeah. buy into it, Mike. You got one? Well, <laughs> no. You know, it's funny. You mentioned the Al Gore thing. And I think it wasn't that he kissed his wife. It's that he. it was like a long kiss yeah, and it's yeah, yeah, yeah. Al Gore. Look, it, my take on this whole thing, and you and I were talking a little bit beforehand, is I, I think there's three ways to look at the whole situation. There's the way people would like it to be. There is the way it is. And then there's the way people perceive it to be. And I think we're mixing all three of those things right now. The way it is is Weez is a great example of this, what you just said. I mean, he has no problem with it all, but there's certain things that bother him a little bit. Maybe someday no one in the world would be bothered. I, I, I find it hard to believe because there's no issue that doesn't bother somebody. So Amen. that way. Then there's the, there are some people who want to sing kumbaya about everything and think everything has evolved and everything is great. And then there's the reality, which it's kind of a mix a little bit. And for Michael Sam, now I saw his news conference the next day. I thought he was excellent. He deflected a lot of those questions. He talked football, football, because that's what's going to make him a player in the NFL. But he invited those cameras in. Oh, that first day. I agree with you. That was different. It, it, it smacked of a reality show more than an NFL guy, I think. That was the only Why? thing. I don't know. I'm glad he kissed because if this, if anybody getting drafted, your girl, every guy who got drafted this weekend kissed their significant other, but kissed their girlfriend or wife. He's not but this story, guy. the re, well, that's why he needed to almost yeah. kiss his boyfriend <laughs> or significant other to say that I am gay and amen. That's why we're there. We're not there to see Michael Sam, the kid out of Missouri. We're see the, we're there to see Michael Good Sam point. and him being gay and more importantly, who's his lover. Amen to Michael Sam. I wish they would have made out a little longer. <laughs> I, I, I would nice. like to say, though, I think Ken Lott, he had a great take. His take was world class. I loved your Thank whole you. rap there. And I think it's right on. You really explained it the way I see it, too, except you got better words. Yeah. <laughs> Dan Wetzel did a column this week, though, and he said, you know, Michael Sam has got two ways he can go with this. He can go the route of Tim Tebow, which was, uh, it, it was a faith-related thing, and Tim Tebow embraced it and showed it to everybody. He can choose the Jackie Robinson model, which was Jackie Robinson was, was put into a box and said, 
adhere to these parameters and allow people to get used to it. Uh, you know, Michael Sam certainly didn't use the Jackie Robinson model and was one that personally I think he, might, he, he, he could have used a little yeah, bit. Yeah, but bro, it's, this is decades and decades after Jackie Robinson. And Jackie Robinson had to put up with a lot of hate during his career. A lot of really, really ugly stuff. And this is a new day and age pushing from Jackie Robinson to this issue, which some people see as a similar issue and some not. And, you know, I think the guy's going, here's what it is. You know, I think if this was, if it was Jackie Robinson now and in reverse, yeah. he might do this like yeah. those guys did at the Olympics, you know, all those other years ago. Maybe, but there are people who aren't uncomfortable with it. And I think there's a tendency uh, for us, us kind of guys, to go too far in being intolerant of the people who just don't get it and need to be eased into the situation. Wait, are you saying that we're, we shouldn't be intolerable of the people that don't get it? Or, well, I think we, you have to make a better, you have to do a better job of trying to understand where they're coming from. But even, Weez, what you said at the beginning of the show, you would get a lot of grief about that from a lot of people. I don't yeah. mind it, though, yeah, because but that's I explain what I'm saying, it, right. Because I, but I, am, I am pro and for equal rights for everybody. I love my homo brothers and sisters, no homo. <laughs> and uh, but the only, can I help it if I get a little queasy when I see the kiss? And it's fair to admit it. it it's we're fair okay to admit with it. Abby kissing her wife or girlfriend on TV, right? Another girl. We're okay one. with that? Another girl. Well, maybe okay. that guy who called your show this week and said I just didn't like it at my kids' no, he didn't, I didn't like, like it like because it. it was two men. If it was two women, amen. Right. True. Amen to every guy watching this program. <laughs> amen. Hundred right. percent. But right? but to Weez's point in the beginning, there is a difference between dislike, hatred, anger, Another and not liking. Another and that's where he is, it well, seems to like me. we like two women kissing, we don't like two guys kissing. No, he's trying to say that I don't, I'm all good with them kissing, yeah. I just don't feel like looking at it. Right. Well, okay. Other people might hate it because of what it represents. Exactly. Something they don't like completely. That, isn't that he, what you're saying? Right, and you know, and the other part about this is, you know why I think Michael Sam, at some point, how do I rephrase this, hope he becomes almost irrelevant is because I think there's going to be active players in the NFL who come out, and I still believe it's going to happen this year. Oh, and they're going to be bigger names than Michael Sam. Because Michael Sam is <laughs> yes. a seventh-round pick I believe who is a wow. nobody in football terms. Yeah, he just did well in the SEC, but nobody knew yeah. him until this. Nobody was paying attention. Active player, especially if it is a good player, Michael Sam. Michael Sam will become Jason Collins. Who pays attention yeah. to Jason Collins? The NBA. He just happened to be the first guy. You need it to be... I still am waiting for it to be a big time player. With him being picked so late, the Rams can cut him without looking yeah, anti most game, seventh right? round They drafted him, him, but they right. can cut a seventh. If he's a high first, second, third round pick, and you cut, I think now they can cut him without feeling any backlash. If they do the cut him, though, it will be controversy. There will be. Yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe, but not as bad I'm if he's a higher pick. There will be if there's not another openly gay player in the NFL. I think that's going to change the whole dynamic of things. All right. From Michael Sam to Johnny Football when we return. Welcome back to Salvatore's Pizzeria here at the Historic Garage Door Restaurant. This is the Press Box with Bill, John, Mike, and Brother Weez this week. Uh, celebrity quarterback, Johnny Menzel. Boy, it was a lot of fuss John made about him to the draft. Why do we like and care about this guy so much? Well, he's, number one, he's the most exciting college player we've seen. You can go, I think, even more so than Tim Tebow. And he's controversial, he's controversial about his off-the-field sort of signing autographs, being seen with celebrities. And he was born with a silver spoon in his mouth, who happens to be a great football player. So he draws backlash, he draws criticism from all around the country, but the kid can play. And I think, and I think he could be an NFL starting quarterback. There was debate on his size, his arm strength, this and that, whether or not he took money from agents, whether he took money from people signing autographs. But we care because he is the most exciting player we have seen in college football in quite some time. Three players have stirred the pot as much as he has in the NFL in the last five to ten years. Favre, Tebow, Johnny Manziel, where they're still polarizing. People glue, are glued to their sets or to the radio when he is coming on or when you see pictures of him. That or because he gets himself into so much trouble. Well, 
Let me make sure my hearing aids are working. Did you say Favre? <laughs> Polarizing players in the NFL. I never even knew he was one of those oh, guys. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What, how do I miss all that? Over the I, last, Favre passed it to Tebow, and then Tebow passed the baton to now Johnny Manziel. I think the way Favre I look came at it. a little later in his little career. In People his career. got tired of the coming back and forth. Look. Yes. I love Johnny oh. football. I'm telling you, I love the guy. I love the way he plays. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you, I, there's a lot of similarities between he and another guy who played and was an exciting college player. And as John would tell you, and I'm sure Weez knows, was as cocky as it could get. But the public perception was a little different. Doug Flutie? Oh, yeah, baby. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but Doug Flutie's public perception was great, whatever. Doug Flutie was tough. Doug Flutie was cocky. Doug Flutie was arrogant. He could play, and he'd play better now, maybe, in the different NFL than he was in before. But it's also different, because everything Johnny Manziel does is now played out in public. Doug Flutie wasn't doing the cocky things, but he was every bit as cocky as Johnny Manziel is trying to make it into the NFL. Now, Bill Parcells famously said, I don't want a celebrity quarterback. And does Manziel's celebrity, you think, help or hurt him as a potential pro? As a potential pro on the field, I think it hurts him a little bit because of that perception there. And Cleveland could make some mistakes by throwing him out there early because he's going to sell the tickets and all those other things. But honestly, I like his cockiness. I like it. I think it works for him. And I think the coaches who have him like that part of him. They like the guy who will not back down. The silver spoon part that John talks about, I think, is a huge portion of why a lot of people dislike him. He's a guy who was born into privilege and you know, he's not the old born on third base and thinks he hit a triple because he has accomplished a lot in college sports. <laughs> he hit a good but line. he did hit a triple in college. Now he's got to try to do it in the NFL. Well, it certainly has made the Cleveland Browns suddenly must-see TV as far as the NFL goes. I'm like a, it or not, a, when... Oh, you got to cut the thing. We, we, do, we do this too, yeah. <laughs> Return, <Sorry. laughs> Welcome back to the historic Garage Door Restaurant here, Salvador's Pizzeria for the Rochester Press Box. Arthur Treacher's is open now in three locations in Rondecoy, Webster, and Avon, and we invite you to go down and see them. Uh, Brother Weez, like it or not, Donald Sterling's appearance on the Anderson Cooper program this week. Well, I mean, it's, uh, this is show business. You know, you've got uh, Real Housewives in New York and every other city but Rochester. You've got pregnant teenagers, and this is the latest sideshow to steal your attention away from serious stuff like politics and wars and everything else. And this is such a great story, the story that keeps on giving. I mean, you got, you got uh, Donald Sterling one day, next day we got uh, uh, Magic Johnson replying. This could go on forever. We got the wife, she's a celebrity now. Uh, Sterling's wife, we played a ton of audio from on our program today. How's our perception of the old man now different than it was when all this broke a week ago? Worse is the perception of people that buy into this story is worse than before because he said some absurdly silly crap on the Anderson Cooper show. The funniest thing he said to him, by the way, I want to tell you a quick joke. He asked, uh, he asked Anderson Cooper, now haven't you ever been in love with a woman? <laughs> 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 haven't you ever been in love with a woman? You know, because, and uh, no, he hasn't. <laughs> uh, maybe if you switch it up with a dude, but uh, that's another story. Yeah. All right, he really didn't do himself any favors. John, no. like it or not, Jacksonville drafting Blake Bortles with the second overall pick. I don't like it, but we'll find out in about two or three years. He may be the first. It's, I, I think Carson Palmer been the last top quarterback to actually ask to sit his rookie. He's going to ask to be sit behind Chad Henney, so we'll find out. I don't know. I, to me, I would have taken Khalil Mack, taken Sammy Watkins, or traded out of the pick, but... I like what they did in the second round, getting Marquise Lee and, and Allen Robbins, at least to put wide receivers around it. But to me, I don't know how much separation it was between Bortles or Garofalo, the kid New England took in the second round. So for him to be the third overall pick, to me, didn't make any sense. But that's why the Jaguars are the Jaguars. Yeah, the feeling was that Jacksonville needed some juice of that pick, that the Manziel would have been yeah. a better pick. Don't you somehow respect Jacksonville for not going that because route? Because they are so far away from being a short-term fix. They have yeah. a lot. And as long as the coach, the general manager, and the owner are on the same page, which is very important, to say you're going to do this and to actually do it. It's easy to do it in New England when Tom Brady's your quarterback. Yeah. You can let Garoppolo sit for three years. He may never play. It's going to be a little harder with Chad Henney and a bad Jacksonville team. You've had the story. Gus Bradley wanted Khalil Mack, who went yeah. to Oakland, who was, many argued, the best defensive player in the draft. They take a guy on promise where Mack, to me, is a guaranteed superstar. 
Well, oh, then it leads right to the other. Like it or not, is more who would you rather be or not be, Chad Henney or Brian Hoyer at this point? Oh, I think I'd rather be Chad Henney because I think yeah. Chad Henney's going to play. I think Brian Hoyer, Brian Hoyer was nothing but a backup, had a few nice starts, even though he threw a few interceptions. People, people lose that because he won three games for Cleveland. Did a nice job. There's a place in the NFL for Brian Hoyer. It's not going to be Cleveland, or certainly not as a starter, because that owner desperately wants Johnny Manziel yeah. on the field. He right now is starting to take the lead as maybe the worst owner in sports, Jimmy Haslam. Uh, he got a guy across town, Dan Gilbert, from the Cavaliers. Yeah. Right neck and neck. Neck and neck in yeah. Cleveland. Haslam or Dan Gilbert. Cleveland may have the two worst owners in maybe sports. Maybe they can hire Mike Brown back and fire him again. <laughs> They've only fired him twice yeah. in the last It'll four be the years. Billy Martin thing. But in this case, I, we know Manziel is going to be the guy. And we know eventually Bortles, at least Chad Henney, likely has bought the year to show he can yeah, play. Still to be either Henny or Hoyer, it's like uh, you're two guys that everyone in the franchise is rooting against. Unfinished business when we return. Welcome back to the Rochester Press Box here from Salvador's Pizzeria at the Historic Garage Door Restaurant. We have Wacky Wings Wednesday, live music every Friday, and pizza the size of your head. Unfinished business, John. You know, when Sammy Watkins being selected in the first round by the Bills, let's hope he goes down as one of the greatest first round picks the Bills have ever had with Jim Kelly, Bruce Smith, and O.J. Simpson, which got me to th uh, thinking this past week, who is the worst first round pick the Buffalo Bills have ever had? We've had some nominees, Weez and our, our friend Mike Williams, <laughs> Eric Flowers, John McCargo, J.P. Lossman, even Perry Tuttle. But my personal winner would be Aaron Maven. This past week, he announced his retirement from the Toronto Argonauts of the CFL. In 27 games with the Bills, zero sacks he had. 14 tackles. Not bad for a guy who was guaranteed $15 million for playing two years. They called him mayhem at Penn State. Well, he didn't cause any type of mayhem with the Bills. In fact... He caused the Bills to pass over a great player with the Washington Redskins and Brian Arakpo. In fact, Brian Cushing, Clay Matthews Jr., some of the guys who were picked after Aaron Maben. So the worst first-round pick the Buffalo Bills have ever had, I believe, in the history, happens to be a Penn State guy, and it pains me to say Aaron Maben. Yeah, I ask you, it hurts that it's Penn State. Two years, 15 mil, 27 games, one start. His only sack, Mike, I think his first preseason game. I think yeah. you're against Ben Roethlisberger yeah. in Pittsburgh. That's it. All right. Brother Wade. Wait a minute, a preseason sack is a sack? We'll give it to him. All right. <laughs> I just want to mention that as a non-deep sports guy like these fellas, I went to see the movie Draft Day with Kevin Costner, and I was entertained. But then when I saw the real draft, I go, how could this be? It, did they catch this from the movie? The same team, Cleveland, engineered a few moves and ended up with the fancy white guy quarterback that was a wise guy and who went to his birthday party. It was the, almost the same deal. And it really freaked me out. I have no idea how something like that uh, worked out. I'm sure a bunch of people watching saw that movie. I hope they were entertained. By the way, I'm going to see the Indian guys that play cricket turn into baseball players in this week's new movie called I Forget What with the guy from Mad Men. Should be fun. It's opening up this week. It's funny. You know, I missed the scene in, uh, in draft day where the seventh round draft pick kissed his boyfriend. I, I, <laughs> They didn't have that. That person filtered it out saying, you know, that could never happen. You know, it's fun. Exactly. <laughs> That's the whole point. They would go, are you kidding? Who's going to believe that? <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to stay with the theme of the draft. And, you know, I hear fans react to the grades put on the draft. And they look at the guys like Mel Kuyper and the like who do grades. Look, here's what I'm going to tell you as a fan. Those guys have a job to do, and actually I think they're pretty thorough and they do it well. But look at a draft guru as a person who looks at it for all 32 teams. They're big on value, value, value. And I'll make the analogy a real estate agent. You're trying to buy a house. They got five houses in the neighborhood. They're all priced the same. They're all close. But you're going to love one, not like one as much. You're the team who picks the player. You're the person who's going to buy the house. You're the one who's got to live there. To the agent, all those houses are roughly the same. To Mel Kuyper, all those wide receivers are roughly the same. 
but he's not the guy who's got to live in the house, and you're, he's not the guy who's got to stick with that player. If you love a player, you go get him. Don't worry about the draft grades. Let them give the Bills a C-. minus. Let them give whatever they like. At the end of the day, can the guy play if he can? Nobody's going to care what you gave up. Nobody's going to care what you did. You could hold on to your pick and take a guy like Aaron Mabin. And then what kind of grade would you have gotten then? All right, let's make it a sweep with the draft. The, uh, the, the trade to get Sammy Watkins into Buffalo really was a, a franchise-defining deal. As John suggested, it's probably one of the four most significant draft picks in the Buffalo Bills history. The odd part about it all is that now that we're a week off the draft, we still really don't know what to make of it. The people who love the deal and the people who hate the deal, on the other hand, are not really that far apart. And that's because it all falls on the quarterback, E.J. Manuel. It's more of a referendum on Manuel than it is on Watkins. When he was drafted, he was a mystery. After a year in the NFL, he's a mystery. He played only 10 games, he missed six injured, didn't even have a preseason. The fact is, two years in, we don't know what to make of E.J. Manuel. This deal was designed to help us all find out. We record the Rochester Press Box here from Salvatore's Pizzeria at the historic Garage Door Restaurant. It'll be Wednesday at 12.30. We invite you to come down, meet the guys. Brother Weez is here once in a while, and have lunch with us, okay? Thanks, everyone. Billy, John, Mike, thanks. Brother Weez, pleasure as always. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week.